Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for another installment from our series of interviews for the Sciences of the Origin project, which explores philosophical and methodological foundations of the scientific quest for the origins of the universe, life and mind through cross-disciplinary interactions. This project is supported by the University of Oxford's project, New Horizons for Science and Religion in Central and Eastern Europe, which is founded by the John Templeton Foundation. So my name is Jan Konesic and I'm a postdoctoral researcher on this project working at the University of Belgrade. And today I will be talking to Philip Goff, a philosopher and a consciousness researcher who is currently working as an associate professor and deputy director at Durham University, UK. So he explored uh, different new approaches to the problem of consciousness and defended the versions of uh, panpsychism and resilient monism, something which we'll, about, with, uh, about uh, which we'll talk today. So he's written many articles on this, philosophical articles, and uh, two academic book, two books, one uh, aimed at academic audience, which is uh, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality in 2017, and another book, Galileo's Error, Foundations for a New Science of Consciousness in 2019. So welcome, Philip, and thank you for agreeing to do this interview with me. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it. I think I'm going to enjoy this conversation. How are you, Philip? How is everything in England? At this Pretty moment? good, considering it's a little bit tricky at the moment with lockdown here and negotiating parental commitments and work with two young children. But, but I can't complain really. I'm uh, love my job and love my kids. So nice to be a bit less busy, but everything's pretty good. How are you doing? It's so, so, so far. It's a bit better right now. And we're starting with the vaccination process and so on. But still, everything is pretty much the same as last year. Yeah. Yeah. So, and as you heard, that we are doing this project that um, investigates the, the, the big questions of origins of uh, universe, life, and mind. So, we will tackle some of these questions today in this interview, mainly the origins of consciousness, and human consciousness, consciousness in general, and of uh, life and universe, for example. So if you, for, for the start, if you could talk a little bit about your current views on the problem of consciousness and how to solve the problem of consciousness, and uh, basically the hard problem of consciousness, when we, think about it. And uh, so, as I said, you defended some versions of panpsychism and Russellian monism. So what is that? Why are these positions important today? And uh, why are they a better solution to the problem of consciousness than materialism, dualism, and so on? Yeah, so maybe we could start with the problem. I mean, what I'm always keen to emphasize from the very start of these discussions is that I don't think the problem of consciousness is just another scientific problem and we just need to carry on with our standard ways of investigating the brain and we'll crack it. I mean, so although this problem is taken very seriously now, that's still a very common reaction to just say, oh, you know, it's just another scientific problem. I don't think that's right. And one way of seeing that quite straightforwardly is that consciousness is not publicly observable. A scientist can't look in someone's head and see their feelings and their experiences. And uh, now, so science is used to dealing with unobservables, but there's something very different here. In all other cases, scientists postulate unobservables in order to explain what we can observe. In the unique case of consciousness, the thing we are trying to explain is, is not publicly observable. So it's a totally different explanatory project. And, um, and I think because of that, there are limits to what we can do experimentally. So I think the problem sort of divides up into 
a scientific bit an, or an experimental bit and a kind of theoretical or philosophical bit. So the experimental bit is the project of mapping out what, what are referred to as the neural correlates of consciousness, trying to work out which processes in the brain go along with which kinds of experience. And so although we can't, how do we do that if we can't observe consciousness? Well, we can ask people as we, we can observe their brains and we can ask them what they're feeling. In the, in the best cases, we can even stimulate a bit of the brain artificially and ask people what it felt like. Um, so that's, that is an experiment. It's, it's an experimental project that's already got lots of philosophical difficulties, but that's at least a kind of experimental scientific project. But that's not the end of the story. Even if we can work out which brain states go along with which experiences, we've still got the question, why? Why do bra certain brain activity, why does certain brain activity go along with experience? Why should that be? And I don't think you can answer that question with an experiment because conscious is not public, consciousness is not publicly observable. You can't, if you're ju just doing more experiments, you're just gonna get more correlations. You'll never get to the why question. And at that point, um, I think we need to turn to philosophy and philosophers just offer, um, have offered a number of different proposals for explaining why it is i don't mean why in a sort of meaning of life sense just why it is it's an explanation of why brain activity and consciousness go together certain kinds of brain activity and we just have to assess those um proposals and try and distinguish between them so that's the more theoretical task and i've got sort of various thoughts on how we do that and i think when you when you when you just do that when you um it, it's plain that the view I prefer, the panpsychist, or, or more generally, as you say, Rossini and Monist options, just look to win hands down over the, the more traditional explanations of either materialism on the one hand, that consciousness is just electrochemical signaling, or dualism on the other, that consciousness is somehow non-physical outside of the physical workings of the body and brain. They're the traditional options. Um, the panpsychist option, I just think, avoids deep difficulties with those more traditional options and hence is the one to be preferred but uh so so, so, th so those are all so you got on the one hand the scientific data how consciousness goes along with brain activity and then you've just got i mean all of these three philosophical theories are neutral on that they they all have their different explanations of that experimental data and we just have to choose between them uh yeah so that's the way i think about it Okay, so maybe a connected question would be, so what do you think about, for example, the, the integrated information theory? Would that be like a philosophical, metaphysical theory of consciousness that you are talking about? Or is it more like a scientific theory of consciousness, so it's not enough to accommodate the, the, the hard problem of consciousness? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's a bit of both actually um so one aspect of iit integrated information theory is a proposal for what kinds of physical states go along with consciousness a proposal for the neural correlates of consciousness and that proposal is that consciousness is correlated with maximal integrated information and we could talk perhaps about what that means so that's just a kind of straightforward experimental hypothesis so that's on the scientific side um but also tononi builds in a lot of a lot of philosophical um background and vocabulary he talks about intrinsic existence he proposes an identity between uh consciousness and maximal integrated information so that's going more into the philosophical bit we had a conference at on IIT in New York a few years ago in the NYU, and a lot of philosophers were saying we could distinguish thin IIT, which is something like the experimental, the, the scientific proposal, from thick IIT, which is all the philosophical framework. 
and Tononi wasn't too keen on separating them out. But um, in terms of the philosophical aspects, they're very interesting, but I don't myself buy it. I mean, philosophy, philosophers never agree. I mean, partly because I've written an, a, a review of Christoph Koch's book on panpsychism from 2019, The Feeling of Life Itself. And I just reject that identity claim because um, well, I mean, the core of the problem with materialism in general, in my view, is that physical science works with a purely quantitative vocabulary, whereas consciousness involves qualities, the, the redness of a red experience, the smell of coffee, the taste of mint. And I don't think you can capture these kinds of qualities in the purely quantitative vocabulary of physical science. And so if you're theory of the brain is framed in a purely quantitative vocabulary, you inevitably just leave out these qualities and hence leave out consciousness itself. Uh, this is another way of saying why it's not just a straightforward scientific project, because we're not trying to explain um, publicly accessible data, we're trying to explain these subjective qualities that are not publicly observable, but we immediately apprehend in our experience. Um, Anyway, so 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 that's why I reject materialism, um, because of this gap between the qualitative and the quantitative. That the reason for the title of my book, Galileo's Error, is that this is well understood by Galileo when he set up physical science. He said, "We want a purely quantitative mathematical science. If we want that, we've got to take consciousness outside of science." So he designed science to ignore consciousness, and now people say. Oh, science has gone so well. Physical science, say. <laughs> physical science has gone so well. Of course, it'll one day explain consciousness. Well, that's a misunderstanding of the history of science. It's gone so well because Galileo designed it to ignore consciousness. Anyway, coming back to IIT, integrated information theory, I think that just has the same problems as materialism because there, I as I discuss in my review of Koch's book, they're trying to identify a purely quantitative state, uh, namely maximal integrated information that's described in purely quantitative terms with the qualitative reality of consciousness. And I just think those identities are unintelligible. So I don't agree with the philosophical bit, but that still leaves thin IIT, the, exper the, the proposal as regards the neural correlates of consciousness. And I'm open to that. I often use it in my papers because it gives us a nice, clear possibility of what might be the neural correlates of consciousness. Um, but I, I, basically, I think it, it's such early days in the science of consciousness. Um, you know, people get very excited by brain scans, but you've got to remember every pixel on a brain scan corresponds to 5.5 million neurons. And we're only 70% away through understanding a maggot brain. Uh, which has much fewer neurons than the 86 billion in the human brain. So I think we're, we're such early days in understanding actually how the brain works. I think we have a basic grip of the basic chemistry, neural firings and action potentials, somewhat of a grip on, on the large scale functions. So we've got some grip on the top and the bottom, but it's the in-between we're almost totally clueless about how those large scale functions are realized at the cellular level. And until we have more of a grip on that, um, I, 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 don't, I just think it's, it's so hard to assess these different neuroscientific proposals like the integrated information theory, global workspace theory, and so on. So I'm kind of, somewhat agnostic. What I try to do, I think of myself as more on the more theoretical end of consciousness science, is to try and answer the philosophical question, work out a proposal of uh, ex how to explain the why consciousness is correlated with brain activity, a general proposal that could fit with any specific scientific proposal of what the neural correlates are. Uh, and often I talk of IAT as an example, but I hope my theory could fit with any in principle. And I would look to the more, the experiment, the experimental uh, consciousness researchers to fill in that bit. So I think, yeah, just fine. I've talked too long, haven't I? But, you know, I think we're used in physics to thinking of the experimental bit and the theoretical bit, but in consciousness, I think we're, 
in consciousness science, people still aren't. People think it's all kind of experimental. Um, and I think because of the unique nature of consciousness, it's not publicly accessible. So we really need to get more serious about the theoretical end. Well, I would agree with that. So I asked because um, there are some philosophers who think that uh, IAT could be combined with uh, some form of panpsychism or resilient monism, or how should we think about IIT for for start? Uh, I mean, should we think about it as a, in metaphysical terms as a physicalist theory of consciousness, or could it be a panpsychist theory? Koch, uh, I think, uh, and Tononi uh, would um, defend a panpsychist version of IIT or something like that. So that's why I po yeah. posed the question. So could it have in it some part of uh, panpsychist inclinations in such a theory? Or could it be just understood as another physicalist, functionalist or materialist theory of consciousness? Yeah, it's a good question. So insofar as we're thinking of thin IIT as just the, the proposal about the neural correlates of consciousness, that consciousness is correlated with maximal integrated information, I think, like any neuroscientific theory, it's just neutral between all the philosophical ish, uh, views. So you could, you, you could, for example, if you're a David Chalmers style property dualist and you were you accepted, uh, persuaded of the truth of IIT, you could explain that as Chalmers does by postulating basics. So Chalmers is a naturalistic dualist. He thinks brain activity and conscious states are distinct, but they're tied together by natural law, by, he, by what he calls psychophysical laws. So he thinks there are these psychophysical laws over and above the laws of physics. If there were just the laws of physics, there'd be no consciousness. But because there are these psychophysical laws, they ensure that when a certain brain activity, uh, conscious experience emerges. So you could combine naturalistic dualism with thin IIT. You could say uh, the reason it, maximal, integrated inf maximal integrated information goes along with consciousness is because there's the fundamental laws, psychophysical laws tie them together. Or you could adopt a materialistic proposal and say, no, there's just, they're just an identity. Consciousness just is maximal integrated information, just as water just is H2O. There aren't two things. Or you could develop a panpsychist or a Rossellian monist approach. Hedda Hassel Merck um, at the University of uh, Inland Sciences, Norwegian Inland Sciences University. Something, I can't remember the exact name of that university. In Oslo. In, uh, in, in or near Oslo. Okay. Um, uh, She's done really interesting work connecting up the two, and she spent some time at Tononi's lab. And so the, the Rossellian monist would say that the conscious state, the consciousness is the intrinsic nature of integrated information. So, so this is the general Rossellian monist proposal or Rossellian panpsychist proposal. It says that it starts from this sort of gap in physics that physics just tells us what stuff does, how it behaves, uh, things like mass and charge is just a matter of just characterized in physics in terms of what stuff does. It leaves us completely in the dark on the intrinsic nature of stuff, what it is in itself considered independently of what it does. Because um, when you're talking about what stuff does, you're, you're talking about its relationships you know, how the particle impacts on other particles. You're not saying anything about the electron in itself. Uh, so, so it leaves completely in the dark. So the, so the, the Rossellian panpsychist puts consciousness in that hole. It says consciousness is the intrinsic nature of matter. So this is not dualistic. Uh, to come back to IIT, the proposed, the idea would be, it's not that we've got in integrated information on the one hand and consciousness on the other, Consciousness is the intrinsic nature of integrated information. So there's three different ways of philosophical ways of interpreting IIT. Uh, you've got the same data. Consciousness goes within maximal integrated information, but three ways of explaining that. They're different, but tied together by natural law. 
I guess, and I guess the materialist proposal is more like consciousness is reducible to maximal integrated information, whereas the panpsychist proposal is maximal integrated information is reducible to consciousness. <laughs> so, so there's three different proposals. So yeah, so I'd be open to the, um, I mean, the way Tononi and Koch talk, it looks like a straightforward materialist proposal, but I mean, that's how it looks to me as a philosopher on the face of it, but maybe that's, maybe then philosophers in, uh, interpreting it in a way they don't really intend it. I mean, it's kind of, it, it's also, it's panpsychist in the sense that it implies that consciousness is more pervasive in the universe, um, but it, it doesn't, but that's different from panpsychism as a sort of philosophical theory of consciousness. Um, and then I think IIT is just, is compatible with all these views, but so is any other theory of consciousness. So insofar as we're just thinking of the experiment, the, the, the neuro, thin IIT, the proposal as to the neural correlates of consciousness, I mean, I think, I think that's compatible with any of these theories and any of the other theories are compatible with all the theories as well. So I don't think IIT necessarily yeah. helps us make progress particularly more than more than other theories of consciousness, but it's it's a it's a cool, interesting theory nonetheless. Okay, thank you. So would you say perhaps we can pose this question at this moment? Uh, if this is like the experimental neural physiological side of the exploration of consciousness and we have the other like uh, the phenomenal side <laughs> aspect of consciousness that we want to explore could perhaps some theories or ideas from the phenomenological tradition be of some importance and use for the analytical philosopher today and uh, analytical analytical analytic metaphysical theories uh, of consciousness so is uh, Phenomenology, in that kind of sense, and ideas from phenomenology are they are they of any importance? Of what importance for metaphysical theories? For example, for the metaphysical problem of consciousness. Yeah. So I think what analytic philosophers are very bad at is characterizing consciousness as it appears to us from the first person mm -hmm. perspective, i.e., consciousness itself. Often, when philosophers of mind talk about consciousness, they talk just about colors and sounds and smells and tastes. And in fact, a, a lot of philosophers, people like uh, Jesse Prince and Michael Tai, think that, that that's all there is to consciousness. Whereas I'm one of a growing movement of analytic philosophers who think that consciousness is much richer than that. It, it, we, we see things as faces. If I'm looking at you now, I. I see a person and a nose and a jumper and a cupboard, and that's part of the character of my experience. In other words, aspects of the character of my experience involve the deployment of concepts. You know, if you see something as a cupboard, that, that, it, that involves the use of a concept. That's something, something um, uh, Susanna Siegel is, is well known for arguing for. Cognitive um, penetration. Cognitive penetration. Or co well, cognitive penetration, it's connected to that, but cognitive penetration could mean merely a causal thing, that, that your cognition affects the conscious Perception. experience. So, I mean, you, Michael Ty could hold that, could think experience is just colours and sounds and shapes, but sometimes there's a causal impact from cognition. Whereas... This view that I'm inclined to is more that it's not just that cognition causally affects conscious experience, but it's involved in conscious experience. In, in fact, I'm inclined to think that thought itself is a kind of conscious experience, sometimes called cognitive phenomenology. Um, uh, so, and, and I think what, what phenomenologists certainly are, are, are much better at us better than analytic philosophers historically are at just characterizing you know these wonderful characterizations of consciousness we get from Husserl for example talk of the you know the horizon and affordances and I think this is being rediscovered in analytic philosophy people like Dan Zahawi um, are very good at this and uh, but 
Yeah, so whether, um, sometimes when, there was a conference, it was about a decade ago now on analytic philosophy and phenomenology. And I found actually many of the phenomenologists had a kind of anti-realist take on things that not believing that it, there's in any straightforward sense a mind independent world I don't I wouldn't like that aspect of phenomenology myself I'm although I'm a panpsychist I think you know there is an external world out there independent of our minds and our thoughts about it but but certainly in terms of benefiting from the insights of phenomenologists in terms of the characterization of consciousness I think that's that's certainly very important and much neglected in my philosophical tradition yes i agree so also like um, things that uh, are common themes in phenomenology like subjectivity and pre-reflective self-awareness something like that the subjective side of uh, consciousness is r rarely a part of discussions in analytic philosophy of mind so Okay, so I wanted to ask another question about the status of uh, individuals or subjects of experience in panpsychism. Well, in whatever is uh, the version of panpsychism that you are that that you are defending right now, for example, could you just talk a little bit about your preferred version of panpsychism or Brazilian monism? That yeah, you are, where you are right now and. Uh, what do you think about subjects of experience in their status? How should we understand subjects of experience in their theory? Good. So, so yeah, I mean, as for panpsychists in general, I would say they'd have lots of different views on this. Some are very reductionist about subjects of experience uh, and think really that the subject or the individual is just a sort of bundle of experiences. Uh, Barry Dainton, for example, defended this kind of view, or Annika Harris in, in her recent book on consciousness. She thinks all of the problems, the classic problem with panpsychism, the combination problem, how do you get lots of little conscious things adding up to a big conscious thing? She thinks this is all rooted in um, the mistaken view that there are subjects of experience um, as opposed to just experience itself. She's writing something on this for a special issue of the Journal of Consciousness Studies coming out on um, in October on, on my book, Galileo's Error, some responses to that. Uh, I am, I suppose, pretty ser more serious about subject. I mean, not that, that makes it sound like, as opposed to frivolous or something. I am, I, I'm more of a hardcore believer in subjects, I suppose. And I suppose I'm, I am incli increasingly inclined to think that subjects of experience are in some sense irreducible that you can't account for the existence of a conscious subject in more fundamental terms and so we have to take them as in some sense irreducible aspects of reality um so the view i've defended um so, so broadly speaking panpsychists are split between strong emergentists and weak emergentists in terms of the connection between um, particle level consciousness and systems level consciousness or biological consciousness. So the, the strong emergentists postulate fundamental laws of nature to bridge that gap. So it might just be a basic law of nature that when conscious particles are arranged in a certain specific way, maybe maximal integrated information, if you like IIT, you just get consciousness associated with the whole emerging just because of this fundamental law of nature. Whereas other panpsychists, people like Luke Roloffs, for example, are much more reductionist. These are the weak emergentists. They want to say, no, we don't need extra laws of nature. Once you've got conscious particles arranged in the right way, that's, that's all, all it takes uh, for there to be a conscious system. So it's a bit like, I always like to give party examples. Uh, if you've got people dancing and drinking and having a good time, you've got a party. The, 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 the being of the party wholly consists in the fact that there's people dancing and drinking. You don't need extra laws of nature to get a party. Uh, similarly, for a reductionist panpsychist, 
the fact that there's a conscious system wholly consists in the fact that there's particles arranged in a certain specific way. So what, what I've defended in, in my most recent paper called um, How Exactly Does Panpsychism Explain Consciousness on my website, I, I, I've tried a hybrid of the two where we're strong emergentists about subjects so so we divide between subjects of experience or subjects the things that have consciousness and conscious experience on the other hand so I've, my hybrid view involves um strong emergentism about subjects so there is but weak emergentism about their conscious experience so there are special laws of nature that ensure that in certain specific circumstances uh local irreducible subjects of experience emerge again you might think that's where you get enough integrated information if you like iit or something else if you like another scientific theory but these new irreducible subjects of experience emerge and i'm one of them and you're one of them but on my view these they don't come with their own new forms of consciousness Rather, they inherit streams of consciousness from the fundamental level, from the level of basic physics. Um, so we're reductionist about, so we're emergentist about the subject, but reductionist about its experience. And I suggest this perhaps solves some of the problems facing both the strong emergentist and the weak emergentist options. So the big problem with the weak emergentist view is it seems to have a kind of explanatory gap it can't bridge. The big problem with the strong emergentist is you might worry if there's all these new forms of consciousness popping up, this would be empirically implausible. So this view I hope solves both of these problems. We bridge explanatory gaps with fundamental laws, but because the forms of consciousness are inherited from the fundamental level, we avoid the empirical worries with other um strong emergentist views so yeah so so i end up being pretty pretty hardcore about subjects of experience i find it difficult so coming back just finally coming back to the party you know all it is for there to be a party is for people dancing and drinking i find it hard how you could give that kind of analysis of a subject of experience you know, all it is for philip to be feeling anxious is for his particles to be doing something i just I don't think you can reduce claims about a particular individual having particular experiences to more fundamental to a more fundamental kind of description. So yeah, so pretty hardcore about subjects, individuals, maybe not necessarily about their experiences though. Yes, I've seen you have a paper together with Luke Rolos uh, on uh, phenomenal sharing. Is that right? Yeah, this yes. is the part about uh, experiences being inherited from. So that's part of it, yes. So, um, so it it well, there's two possibilities. So, so the, the paper I defend with uh, paper I've written with Luke Roloffs, um, we talk about we defend the coherence that two subjects of experience could have what could share. A single token experience in common. So if you imagine maybe two conjoined twins, maybe parts of their brains overlap, there might be one headache that they both they're both experiencing. So it's not just not merely that they have um the, the same, it's not merely that they have exact qualitatively the same, qualitatively similar experiences, they have numerically one and the same experience. So, so that's one way of running this that I might, this reductionist picture that I might, even though my mind is irreducible, my mind might share experience with my particles. Although the view I've, I ended up describing, defining in my paper that I referred to earlier is slightly less reductionist than that. The idea is the, the, the is more what I call inheritance that the, the consciousness ceases to belong to the level of physics uh, and it be, comes to be inherited, comes to belong to the biological subject. And then when the biological subject ceases to be, those streams of consciousness go back to the fundamental level. So it's sort of going up and down. Well, actually, I, actually, in my paper, I run it in a, in a cosmopsychist version where it's actually 
the universe that is the fundamental thing. So actually it's the streams of consciousness from the universe descending to the biological level and then returning to the level of the universe. That sounds a bit mystical, but it's the paper's just a really sort of cold-blooded um, naturalistic proposal. But yeah, that's the idea. Yes, good that it's good that you pointed in this direction to a cosmopsychism, because I want to come to this issue. Uh, recently, you've written for some more popular forms of essays or papers uh, towards the, the, the issue of fine tuning of the universe. Uh, so we, we find this evidence for fine tuning, but what to make of it is, is the philosophical problem. So some would say how to find an explanation for fine tuning, what would be the best explanation for fine tuning, would it be a theistic theory or multiverse theory of some sorts or some kind of uh, even panpsychism, cosmopsychism. So what is your position on that right now? Is it, is it part of your theory of cosmopsychism and uh, related to that because you have a, that piece in the Eon magazine that you talk about cosmopsychism and fine tuning or is it something else? Could you please, yeah, please so, elaborate in the... so I've just published just this this last week an article in Scientific American arguing that there's a there's a fallacy, a fallacious inference involved in moving from the fine tuning to the multiverse. There's just a, a straightforward fallacious inference there. What's known as the invert inverse gambler's fallacy. And actually this has been discussed for decades by philosophers, mm -hmm. but in these very dense Bayesian articles and you know, philosophers don't communicate enough. So what I was glad to do with this article, I mean, this is crazy because there's huge interest in fine tuning among scientists and the public, um, but no one has any idea out of this outside of academic philosophy. So I was very happy to get that idea out to a broader audience. And I'm writing an academic version of that where actually link the philosophical discussion to the scientific discussion which actually no philosophers have done in this particular discussion of the inverse gambler's fallacy um so i mean we could talk about that but so i don't like the fine tuning so i don't like the uh, multiverse explanation uh because i don't i think there's a there's a, there's a fallacy in the end i mean if if we had independent evidence for a multiverse of the right kind it might solve the problem but well, this is what I talk about in the article. I, I, I don't think you can use the fine tuning as evidence for a multiverse. But I don't like the theistic hypothesis either because I'm, I mean, I'm totally persuaded by the problem of evil, at least for the most traditional conceptions of, of God. I don't think a loving, all powerful God would create a universe like this with so much suffering, creating intelligent life through such a long-winded torturous process like natural selection so so yeah so i don't like i so i was actually very reluctant to give up the multiverse hypothesis i'd always assumed that for a long time but i was totally persuaded that there is this logical fallacy uh in that position so what do, so just coming di directly to your question what what what, sh what does the fine tuning tell us i think fundamentally what it tells us what it is is strong evidence that considerations of value somehow shaped the early stage of the universe and that that's weird and that's not what we expect but i think we have to follow the evidence where it leads and you know that's the spirit of the enlightenment you should just follow the evidence where it leads uh, but I think human beings aren't very good at that because they get in a certain conception of how science ought to be and it doesn't involve teleology or uh, value or something. But then it turns out we have this very strong evidence that considerations of value have played a role in somehow in shaping the universe. Um, I mean, just because, just to make that clear and explicit, you know, it's not, people say, oh, the fine tuning's improbable. That's not it, because I mean, any any values of those constants that had come up that would be equally improbable 
what's surprising is that they are against all the odds exactly the values necessary to have a universe of great value with intelligent life and you know any other most of the other combinations many of the other values of the strong nuclear force for example you just have hydrogen the simplest element so that to my mind, in, and we sh this shouldn't be as debated, as contested as it is, because we now have mathematically precise definition of evidence, ways of understanding evidence from Bayes' theorem. You just, we could talk about, you could just do a straightforward Bayesian inference to reach that strong confirmation for that hypothesis that considerations of value have played a role somehow in shaping the um, early state of the universe. So, we just have to face up to that and try and theorize how it could have happened. But I don't think we need to postulate anything supernatural. So, so yeah, I've worked out a kind of cosmos. I think on reflection, it doesn't actually need to be cosmopsychist. Just a view in which um, the universe, part of the workings of the universe involve responsiveness to value. So how does, I mean, the, the way I've worked it out is, is just drawing on the observation of David Hume that we, we don't know, uh, science just tells us how things behave. It doesn't tell us why they behave. You know, uh, Newton gave this law of gravity, mathematical law describing uh, the work, you know, that how objects behave. Uh, and people said to him, why does that happen? And he said, in Latin, I don't frame hypotheses, right? So, you know, mathematics, math physicists just give us these mathematical laws. They don't explain why. So I, I've proposed that it's, it's, um, it's a coherent, empirically adequate proposal that actually what's going on is, is, is the universe trying to, ma what is really driving the show is the universe trying to maximize value. You might think, okay, well, if the universe is trying to do that, how, why are things not better? And what are the laws of physics doing? Well, so on this proposal, the laws of physics are, mar record the constraints, the limitations of the universe. So this is not an all powerful deity. This is um, something that's trying to maximize um, value, but under certain constraints, not imposed from outside, just, it's just limited in in what what it's able to do and the thought is there'd be and here i cheekily borrow from multiverse theorists there would be some flexibility in the earlier stages of the universe for shaping those constants if we bring in kind of string theory um as it's sometimes put on string theory the constants the physics the constants are thought of as a sort of a phase of space so and, and multiverse theorists hypothesize that that was kind of up for grabs in the very early stages of the universe. So, so we've got a universe that's maximizing value, but under constraints, and those constraints were a little bit less settled in the early stage of the universe, and we explain the fine tuning that way. So there's lots of more details that need to be filled out. But I mean, like I find increasingly on, on many of the arguments for God, I think, you know, there's, there's some force to this argument, but I don't see why we have to posit anything supernatural. We just try and and that's that's really often my approach to these things that you know i I've, I've don't like either extreme of sort of ignoring these things that seem obviously to have force or retreating to the supernatural i think there's clearly a strong argument here uh that value is playing a role in shaping the early universe we just need to uh but we don't need anything supernatural we just try and need to try and work out how that could happen yeah so that's the approach i i, I currently favor okay so it's still like a cosmopsychist version of the theory okay so it doesn't it, but i've realized that you don't really necessarily need the universe to be conscious perhaps just something that's responding to value maybe maybe you think that has to involve consciousness not necessarily though could you just elaborate a bit on that what what does it mean to have a position like cosmopsychism is the cosmos one um, one subject of experience or something like that? How, how should we understand that? But not in theistic, individualistic uh, terms or something like that. So panpsychists think that the fun, they don't necessarily think that literally everything is conscious. 
the idea is that the fundamental building blocks of the physical world are conscious. So if you're thinking in terms of fundamental particles, like if you think the world is built out of fundamental particles like electrons and quarks, then the panpsychist would be, view would be that these fundamental particles have incredibly simple forms of experience. And then the conscious, the complex experience of the human or animal brain is somehow built up from those. But many physicists, many theoretical physicists prefer to think in terms of universe wide fields rather than particles fits better with quantum field theory. So if we think the fundamental building blocks are these universe wide fields, and then particles are just sort of local excitations in those fields. If we combine that with panpsychism, then the fundamental forms of consciousness would turn out to be the intrinsic nature of those fields. And the, 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 the bearer of those fundamental forms of consciousness, if there is one, maybe we go back to this point, some panpsychists don't like subjects, but if you do think there are subjects where you have consciousness, then the bearer, the subject that has the fundamental consciousness is going to be the universe itself, the bearer of those fields. So you get a kind of cosmopsychism. But yeah, this, I, I defended a form of cosmopsychism in my academic book, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality. But there, this wasn't an intelligent agent or, um, you know, anything like that. It wasn't um, sort of good. It was just a mess you know it's just it, it, it wasn't something I, I i assumed in writing that book that you have to be subject to millions of years of natural selection to become an intelligent agent this was just the kind of messy consciousness it was the fundamental form of consciousness but it was just a mess um but if you if you then bring it so i think that's all you'd get if you're just trying to explain consciousness but if you then bring in the fine tuning then you might have reason to attribute slight, you know, some more sophisticated mentality to the cosmos, responsiveness to value. Um, awareness of, in some sense of, of the consequences of actions, because... At one point, I'm sorry for inter interrupting, you call it agentive cosmos. Yeah, I so I call that agentive cosmos psychism. You know, maybe that's, that word can put certain people off, you know, I, I mean, the key thing is responsiveness to value. So you, you needn't think of this as, as, a, as an agent like a human being. In many ways, it may be much more limited than us. We're kind of flexible and we've got these very flexible mental representations. This could just be a thing that just, just responds to value and it's not sort of, sort of thinking, oh, what should I do today? Or it's just responding to value. Um, is that an agent? But I was thinking of an agent as something that responds to value. But perhaps the word agent can maybe be a little bit misleading, but yeah. So what do you think the, the response or what's the response you get from scientists, uh, physicists and philosophers of science for, for such ideas about fine tuning and so on? I haven't talked to, about this too much. I have, um, I got a very angry blog post from um, Jerry Coyne, who's, written about 13 angry blog blog posts about me to this date actually <laughs> one of them was um one of them was about this stuff but i mean he's i i think very very ideological sort of individual but um yeah i guess i mean i think this is the problem that if you think about the spirit of the enlightenment what was the enlightenment all about it was about two things on the one hand it was about just following the evidence and the arguments where they lead but on the other hand, it was like it, it involved a certain conception of, of what science should be, what the universe looks like, according to science, that it's sort of mechanistic and not teleological. And I think since the middle of the 20th century with the fine tuning, they've come apart because the evidence is sort of pointing towards something teleological, whereas, um, you know, the, the picture of science that we've had for 400 years is pointing in the other direction. So, you know, I think people are naturally conservative and, and it's very hard to just look dispassionately at the evidence, but it gets into people's identity and their sense of who they are, that this, this is the, this is the truth. And, you know, we're not like those idiots. And um, so, yeah, so you, 
you do get hostile reactions from, but then other people like, you know, Sean Carroll, who I'm sure couldn't disagree with me more, <laughs> is, is very happy to discuss in an open-minded spirit and, you know, who knows what's right, who's right ultimately. And um, so, you know, and many of my closest friends, like, uh, you know, great philosophers of physics, like Barry Lower, who again, are totally the opposite view, but are, are you know, we have mutual admiration for each other's work and, you know, and um, you have that, that wonderful open-minded debate and discussion and um, that's the way it should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. So perhaps just for the end, we don't have much time. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what, what, how do you see the future of metaphysics, <laughs> so to speak? You said the true post-Galilean, the physics hasn't begun yet. So what the future holds for metaphysics of consciousness and, and in general? Yeah, great question, big question. Um, so I think we're going through a phase of history where people are have been so blown away by the success of physical science and the incredible technology it's produced that they're inclined to think, this is it, this is everything. We've, we've found the truth, we've found the... But in my view, if you trace, you know, trace things back to the start of the scientific revolution, I think the reason it's been so successful is, is because it was designed for a quite focused specific task, namely accounting for publicly observable data with in you know, a quantitative vocabulary. But I think there are lots of things we know to be real that can't be accounted for in that way that are not but that it's just a totally different explanatory project you know with consciousness for example it's not about accounting for publicly observable data it's about accounting for these invisible subjective qualities that we immediately apprehend in our experience uh so consciousness is the most obvious one but and i think that's the one that's going to persuade the world in the first instance but other things like you know facts about value um facts about uh, possibly about uh free agency um facts about the, about about the nature what what grounds mathematical and logical truth um there are many things that need to be accounted for many questions we need to answer in to inform our theory of reality that aren't straightforward scientific questions. So I, I think we need to get out of this scientific phase um, to, to appreciate that there are things we know to be real, not on the basis of observation and experiments. That's our current worldview. Um, the only things we should really believe in are the things we know on the basis of observation experiments. If you religiously follow that, you wouldn't believe in consciousness. Daniel Dennett is wonderfully consistent on this because consciousness is not known about in that way. So, I, and I, I think we're getting there. I think we've gone from people denying the existence of consciousness in much of the 20th century, pretending it doesn't exist. People now taking it very seriously because you can't really pretend it doesn't exist. Um, but still thinking, oh, we'll just do more science. I think people are now starting to see the, philosoph the philosophical underpinnings of the problem, see that it's not a straightforward scientific problem. I think that consciousness will, has to, I think, ultimately break us out of this scientific phase of history and perhaps open us up to the fact that there are other things we know to be real uh, that also are not straightforward scientific phenomena. And that will be a, a radical shift in the way we think about science, the way we think about reality. And I think at, at, at that stage, you know, we can start for the first time in history doing metaphysics properly. I think we've never been in a, in a phase in history where we've had mature natural science, we've had serious metaphysics, and where we've had people taking consciousness seriously. I think, you know, the last 30 years, we've started to get serious metaphysics and we're starting to get people taking consciousness seriously again. I think when we have at least those things in position, we can start for the first time in history really doing metaphysics properly. But, you know, so people say, oh, metaphysics never got anywhere. I just think, we, you know, we haven't really started it yet. 
and it's about time we got on with it and it might go to work. <laughs> okay thank you Philip uh, we'll just finish the interview on that very optimistic note so thank you again for taking the time to talk to me today about all these topics it was a very great pleasure to talk to you today so just to make a short uh, ending to this say please stay tuned for more interviews with philosophers scientists and theologians on the topics of the origins <laughs>